you brought up like diet tribes, food religions, if you will. And I think that also exists in the fasting world where you see people that are just super dogmatic about fasting. Like fasting is the only way to do this, that, and the other. I know this is one of the things you talk about in your new book. So what are your thoughts on fasting? And do you think it actually is worth the hype? Listen, I'm so glad that you asked me about that because my new book is titled Eat to Beat Your Diet. And it's not a diet book. In fact, it's kind of an anti-diet book because it actually shows you, it's a little bit of a kind of a trick title. It actually shows you how you can be healthy without having to jump onto a ship of an extreme point of view or an extreme practice. And let's talk about fasting for a second. You know, here's the reality. I mean, I think that you're probably sensing this from our conversation today. I'm a pretty reasonable person, but I'm uncompromising when it comes to science. Here's the fact. We actually all fast anyway. Fasting is what happens when we're sleeping and we're not eating. That's the definition of fasting. So whether you're sleeping for five hours a day, six hours a day, hopefully seven or eight hours a day, which is healthy sleep, during that period of time, all right, we're not eating. And that's called fasting. And when we get up, take a shower, get dressed, go down to the kitchen and you know pour ourselves something, we are breaking our fast, which is why it's called breakfast. All right. And so there's really no religion or crazy breakthrough idea about fasting. It's how the body's wired. When we're sleeping, we're not eating or fasting. When we eat, we're actually breaking our fast. Now, what is new and what does actually help argue for increasing the period that we're not eating, meaning increasing our lengthening our fasting time, is that when we're fasting, we are allowing our metabolism, the way that our body's hardwired, okay, our operating system, to be able to actually burn down extra fuel. Let me explain this to you. So when we eat food, okay, when we're breaking our fast, okay, which is breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe some snacks, all right, what we're doing, and this is what metabolism is all about, it's all about fuel. Just like when you're driving a car, you got to load fuel into your car at the filling station, when it's loaded up, you can actually get in your car and drive away, and the engine uses that fuel to keep you powered. That's what we do when we're eating. We're eat, putting fuel into our body, and then we're actually going about our day. We're actually burning our gas, our fuel. Now, what happens is that our body's hardwired so that when we are eating, we can't burn that fuel, okay? Like our body is in completely in storage mode. It's only when we're not eating, okay, that we're actually able to burn that fuel down. So think about this. The longer we're not eating, let's say sleeping late, okay, or just not eating before you go to sleep, no midnight snack, and maybe having a late breakfast or maybe even skipping breakfast, you're extending the period of time where your body is able to burn down fuel. Well, what happens? You're actually cleaning your pipes. You're burning that extra fuel that you might have accumulated from the day before, the day before that, and your metabolism is actually just burning down that fuel because you're working on that hardwired system, that operating system where when you're not eating, you're able to burn down fuel. So you want to stay trim and lean. You want to lose harmful extra body fat, lower inflammation. Fasting actually does that for you. And by the way, other systems also respond well to that energy burning, fuel burning stage. Your circulation improves. Your stem cells improve. Your gut microbiome use that as a period to reboot itself. Your DNA is able to stand back from all the stuff you might pour into the body. And your immune system also improves as well. Reboot. So fasting is actually normal and kind of good for you. This idea. So I'm trying to tell you, we already intermittently fast just by going to bed. All right. And we can tweak it now because we're beginning to understand if you fast a little bit longer, it's better for you. But this idea that you have to fast until you go into ketosis and then you, you know, if you fast for days on end, you know, these kind of extreme ideas. Okay. They might be okay for the short term. Your body's not going to like it for the long term, I guarantee you. And it's going to wear down your health eventually. And so it's just like you want to fuel your car on a regular basis, and you never want to overfill it. So that's another kind of caveat to this whole thing. But you want to run things normally. And for people that want to live long and prosper, you know, that old Star Trek Spock kind of thing, you want to be reasonable. And you want to enjoy your life and you want to do things that are not too unreasonable. And that's why these extreme patterns are really unsustainable and don't give you pleasure as well. So I'm all about sustainability, pleasure, and biology all at the same time. Absolutely. And I think fasting can be a great tool too to keep your calories in check if your goal is weight loss and trying to lose weight because it reduces your, your eating window 
I know that weight loss is a theme of your new book as well. And you talk about some new things as it relates to that. And I know typically when people think of weight loss, they say that, you know, you, it revolves around like energy expenditure and calories in, calories out that you're like, what you're consuming versus what you're like, how much you're moving and stuff like that. I'm like, what are your thoughts on weight loss? And like, what other insights do you have to share on that that's featured in your new book? Yeah, well, so my book does talk a lot about weight loss and foods that have been shown in human research that allow you to lose weight. Now, this is not the quick fix, lose 20 pounds in two weeks kind of thing. I mean, there are things that you can do to aim for that, but it's not healthy for you. It's not sustainable. But what I really talk about is how I kind of uncloak how human metabolism works. So how many of us have heard this idea that, well, you're born with either a fast metabolism genetically or a slow metabolism? And people will point out, look at my sister. She was so lucky she was born with a fast metabolism. That's why she's skinny as a stick and eat anything. And that's has a problem. And then they always point me. On the other hand, I was born with a slow metabolism. My genetics aren't really good. And so I've been struggling with my weight the whole time. And that's a very common kind of, it's a common idea that's out there, but it's an urban legend. And I'll tell you when this urban legend was overturned just about a year ago, there was a landmark study that changed everything we know about human metabolism. And this was done by a study by a researcher named Herman Ponzo out of Duke University. And he studied 6,000 people involving 19 countries. Okay. And he studied metabolism in people across the human lifespan from two days old to 95 years old, the entire human lifespan and studied 6,000 people in exactly the same way. By the way, these people were male and female, men and women, girls and boys. They were um, young and old. They were healthy and sick. Some of them had diabetes. Some of them had big body frames. Some of them were skinny. And when they studied the metabolism in exactly the same way, here's what they did. They gave everybody a drink of water, H2O is what we call water, in which the H of hydrogen and O of water, oxygen, had a special atomic signature, not radioactive, but everybody drank the same. Now you can measure in the lab the hydrogen and oxygen, and therefore your metabolism in your breath, in your urine, in your blood. And so imagine this, 6,000 people across the human lifespan from days old to 90 years old in exactly the same way. And they looked at the metabolism. What did they find? All over the map, scattergram. Everything is completely confusing. And so they said, oh, well, you know, isn't this what we just expect is that everyone's got a different metabolism? Well, that's not where the breakthrough came. The breakthrough came, they developed an algorithm right, in which they could actually subtract out from the results of the study, the contribution of excess body fat, okay, we call fat adipose tissue. When you actually employed this algorithm to remove from the scatter of data, that remove the effects of excess body fat, it was like bada bing, human metabolism emerged only four phases of metabolism across humans over the course of life. Everyone followed the same exact same pattern. So the inner workings of our metabolism are exactly the same. This idea that you were born with fast or slow, completely wrong. And the four phases are absolutely fascinating. Zero to one, your metabolism skyrockets when you're a baby to one year old. At one year old, your metabolism, baby's metabolism is faster, 50% faster than their, their metabolism as an adult, okay? Which is surprising from one year old to 20 years old, all the way through puberty, when you see kids sprouting up, when they're super active, when they're eating two dinners, teenagers, okay, metabolism is going down, 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 down. Okay, to, so completely different than what we thought. From age 20 to age 60, metabolism is completely rock stable is how we are hardwired. This is through your first job. This is through your pregnancy. This is through your menopause. All right. It's exactly the same. And then from age 60 to 90, it does decline a little bit, only about 17% by the time you're 90 compared to when you were 60, which is the same as compared to your 20. So when you're 90 years old, our hardwired metabolism is only 17% lower than when you were 20. Now, here's what happens. So that's the pattern of human metabolism. Like It's a bombshell that this is how we're actually wired. Now, what happens is that when you start adding back the effects of body fat into that equation, what do you think happens? You take this beautiful four-stage pattern and you start to suppress it, okay? So you squash the metabolism. So it's not that slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat and gain weight. It's that extra body fat and weight 
squashes your metabolism. It's completely the other way around. And the reason that that's why that's important, and back to your question about, so what do I think about weight loss? I think that not everyone needs to lose weight, but everyone needs to understand that excess body fat, including skinny people that might not be able to see their body fat. It could be packed like peanuts inside a thin frame. Like, okay, you go to FedEx, you're going to ship, you know, some long fluorescent lights. You're going to put the lights in the box. You're going to add peanuts in it. You can overpack peanuts, tape it up, still a skinny box, but it's way overstuffed. And in our skinny bodies, in a skinny body, you can have that, those extra peanuts and harmful fat choking your organs and releasing really harmful inflammatory substances. So here's what I think. I think we should all try to aim at getting back to our baseline metabolism so we can be who our body wants us to be from a metabolic perspective. And part of that is by fighting extra body fat. We can do this with exercise and you need to stay active, but we can also do that with by eating food. And so this is the kind of the irony of what I write about. You can eat to beat your fat. And there's even more surprises because you can actually harness and leverage good fat to burn down bad fat. And so this is there's all these series, really surprises that turn the equation around. Don't fear your food. Use your food. Don't fear your fat because we need some fat to, to live. You need to tame your fat and so on and so forth as it relates to weight loss. That's such interesting stuff because I was always one of those kids too who was like, man, that person's just lucky if they have a fast metabolism or she's just lucky she has a fast metabolism. And you're right. We hear this all the time. So let's just say we have that person that might be reading your book. They're listening to this podcast and they're like, wow, I do have a bunch of extra body fat to lose. I want to be able to, in a way, jumpstart my metabolism and do what I can to control my metabolism so that I can get rid of this stuff as fast and a healthy way as possible. Like, what are a few things that you think are shown by science or that you could recommend to help them do that? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. So first of all, in my book, I read about 150 foods. I think this is the first book that I ever did is 150 foods that have been shown by human clinical research that they can actually improve your metabolism, decrease the amount of body fat, reduce your waistline, and improve things like your blood sugars and your insulin sensitivity and the healthy hormones that relate to your metabolism. Okay. And so I think this is the first book ever to put together this compendium of all these foods. So let's pick a few out. Okay. Because we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll pick a few standouts. All right. Turns out tomatoes have a lot of good things about them. They're a great source of vitamin C. They're, they do have some dietary fiber, but they also have these bioactives, natural chemicals called carotenoids, one of them called lycopene. Lycopene, many people might have heard about, but lycopene is a fat-fighting bioactive. Here's what it does. It actually takes our harmful fat and helps to burn it down by activating a special kind of fat we have in our body called brown fat. So brown fat can good fat can burn down white fat, which is harmful fat, dangerous fat, and eating tomatoes will light that up. It kind of lights up the space heater and uses fuel so you can improve your metabolism, improves your metabolic profile overall, lowers bad cholesterol. This is all with tomato and actually shrinks your waistline as well. One study that was done actually took normal, healthy young women who were not overweight or obese Okay, because many researchers, many much a lot of research is done with people who are already overweight, but this is actually taking young, healthy female grad students who don't have extra weight. They're considered normal body size, whatever that means. Okay, that, that, that can be debated. But the bottom line is that they had just one tomato to eat before lunch every day, and they were able to lose weight and improve their metabolism. Very achievable dosing. So tomato can actually do it. Here's another one. Strawberries have also been shown to actually improve your metabolism. And what's really interesting by eating strawberries is that although strawberries can be sweet, when they measured blood sugar, eating strawberries in a way to improve your metabolism, not only decreased weight and uh, waist size and lowered weight and decreased body fat, it also didn't raise blood sugar. So this whole idea, another kind of like common idea that's kind of a uh, kind of like a paintbrush idea. Eh, don't eat fruit. It's got too much sugar in it. It's got too much fructose. It might kind of sound like it makes sense 
a, a casual level, but the science actually doesn't show that. And the reason is that the bioactives in the strawberry activate your body. So it starts to burn down the bad fat. Okay. So you can actually metabolize even faster. This is, by the way, not about trying to become a supermodel. This is about optimizing your engine of your body. And I think that's something that we really want to be able to emphasize. Look, people that want to actually look like you know a supermodel, they want to fit into a bikini body back, they need to get into a wedding dress, they need to actually get you know, go for a, a bodybuilding competition. Those are short-term things that people do extreme things for. Okay. I'm not categorically against that. I'm just saying that, and what I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is we should all be trying to do things that are good for our health over the course of our lifetime if we want to live long and prosper you know, and thrive. This is what longevity is all about. So another food that can actually, actually have incredible benefits is actually tea. Just sipping green tea actually has been shown to decrease excess body fat as well. So remember I told you this experiment where you know, you, when you remove the effects of body fat, your real metabolism starts to shine. And when you add unhealthy foods and you add extra fat back, you'll start to suppress your metabolism. So this is really the concept. We have a hardwired program inside us that goes through four phases of metabolism. If you want to be all you can be, work on the, some of the body fat, work on the metabolism. You can eat foods like tomatoes and strawberries and green tea. And there's 150 other foods, including seafoods that I have in there that can all work in harmony to help you get there. And so this isn't about a fad diet. This is really about a lifestyle and trying to embrace and enjoy your life as well. Yeah. 